me start off on the computer funding with COJ, his house, so to speak, Peter G. Post, and looking about the Benjamin Center, but also about the Lincoln Foundation. And of course, your support for our mission. Sure, thank, thank you, Leon. We're, we're happy to have you here um, in our new conference space here on the third floor. The uh, Philanthropy Center was started about four years ago when we bought the old University Club and envisioned it as a center for nonprofit, for convening, for community, uh, for philanthropy. And uh, I'm pleased to say that the original vision has come to pass. We're fully leased. Um, there are 10 uh, nonprofit foundation tenants here in the building, along with the Community Foundation. Um, we had a record number of usage, amount of usage of the building, including the ballroom downstairs and these spaces. So, Creating a, a, a third place, another place where many people can come together with uh, common public purposes is uh, um, was part of the vision and we're really happy to have you here as a part of continuing that. <coughs> the Community Foundation is um, 88 years old this year. Um, we've been growing and thriving. Um, the uh, foundation is uh, manages about 700 individual charitable funds and balance foundations with a collective value of almost $200 million. So we've grown significantly through gifts and investments. Last year we distributed uh, almost $10 million. Um, we've had a real interest in nonprofit capacity issues, in literacy, um, and a whole host of things that are systemic around the community. Um, the work that you're doing uh, was part of that. We made a, a grant in February in support of public outreach uh, as part of your campaign to get out into the community about the issues that you're studying. Uh, along with all the other foundations. So uh, our work was an example of a foundation collaborative. There are quite a number of times when foundations come together collectively to support projects in this way. Thank you, Peter. Peter, Peter's largely leadership in that way. members of the committee 
um, some uh, outside experts from the community that are members of the commission that has really helped to inform the, the dialogue at the committee level. Um, and we've also had uh, a great uh, group of guest speakers that have come in. I think about uh, the Municipal Operations Committee or the Public Safety Committee where we've had um, uh, outside experts come in and actually present about what they do and uh, the challenges that they face, how those challenges, how the delivery of those services has changed um, over time. And it's really uh, helped to inform those conversations. As we said when we um, released the baseline report, that was not intended to be the end of the information gathering phase of this process. It was really intended to be a, a point of departure, a basic information foundation. And the committee process uh, has really uh, proven that to be true as, as we've gone down uh, different pathways and collected additional data and done further analysis. So um, I just wanted to uh, thank all the members of the commission for uh, the time and energy that they've invested in the committee process because it's really uh, it's really been um, uh, you know, uh, we've made great progress and it's been a, a critically important part of getting us to this point. In terms of what comes next for the committees, um, different committees are at different stages in the process. So. Um, there are uh, some committees, uh, two in particular that I can think of, that are nearing the point where um, we will have some recommendations. Over the next meeting or two, we'll be um, uh, beginning to formalize recommendations. I think about the infrastructure committee where we've talked about uh, streets and highways, for example, um, and beginning to identify uh, some opportunities that, that seem to make sense. Um, you're beginning to, uh, to, to put meat on those bones, to turn those concepts into more tangible structures. Um, similar conversations at the Public Safety Committee and elsewhere where, um, where we'll get some more detail in just a bit. There are other committees where we're still um, kind of at the, at the conceptual level, where we're gathering information, we're not yet ready to make recommendations. That's completely to be expected with a process like this, different committees. Um, uh, have different purviews, they'll move at different paces, and there's different amounts of information that need to be collected. But uh, in total, I do want to make the point that, um, that we're really happy, uh, the CGR team at least, is really happy with where the committee process stands um, right now. Um, in, in terms of uh, uh, the schedule, then, just a couple more points I want to make. In terms of the schedule of where we go from here, uh, remember back to our conversation at the February Commission meeting, and we've talked about this since in each of the, uh, uh, the February Commission meeting, and we've talked about it since in each of the committee <coughs> meetings. Our goal has been to, uh, around roughly the end of July, to have a working set of recommendations across the, uh, across the committees. Um, I still think we're on target to be able to meet that. Um, these aren't going to be the, um, you know, the, the once and for all, end all, be all recommendations, but what we do want to be at by the end of July is a point where we have you know, a reasonable degree of confidence that, um, that we are going down the right pathway, that we've identified where there are opportunities to improve, that we've identified those opportunities so that we can then, once we get into August, begin to synthesize across all of the committees. Um, remember, we have, as I talked about in the February Commission meeting, We'll be looking for the commission to make recommendations at a global level, which are you know, any opportunities around um, governing structures or the fiscal connections or interconnections uh, among communities within Onondaga County, um, collaborative frameworks to the extent that there are opportunities for, for region for, to incentivize regional collaboration, uh, governing structures. So those are really the global level recommendations. We're also going to be looking to make um, recommendations where we see opportunities on the uh, kind of ground level. Um, services, individual services, um, you know, the six or seven that, uh, uh, that your committee and municipal operations is dealing with, three in public safety, infrastructure, and so on. So we'll be, uh, really August will be an opportunity for our team to synthesize the recommendations, make sure they're uh, coherent, logically consistent, and that we can fit all the pieces of this uh, jigsaw puzzle together. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have about uh, where we are in the process. Like I said, I want to say the substantive updates uh, to the committee chairs, I do just want to point out um, for the governance uh, committee, um, June 23rd 
Uh, you may be planning to mention this already. Steve is on the phone. Oh, Steve is on the phone. All right, well, I'll, I'll leave that to him. We have a couple of governance conversation committees that are coming up that are going to be really nice opportunities for all the commission members to hear from some national experts, people that have kind of been there, done that in the government modernization arena. So, um, so hopefully folks are able to, uh, at the very least, listen in and ideally actively participate in those conversations. Questions for me? Bill. Yeah, um, I was watching the interview that, that you did with Dan Cummings when we were show, which, which was really good. I thought, yeah, I thought you did a great job with that. You, you talked about the term options. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you discuss that in terms of where we're headed? Yeah. Is, would, it, would an option be a subset of recommendations, or would it be something separate? Or, um, you know, just conceptually, I, 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 I was interested in that. Sure. I mean, so, yeah, so, so, so the options, I mean, we think about your committee in particular, right? I mean, the, the options um, uh, start with the introduction of, of the white paper, right? So in the case of infrastructure, we think about streets and highways. We say, here's how we're doing it today. And as we scan the, you know, the, the universe of potential options, right? We have local options, we have regional options, and then we have one or more kind of hybrid options in the middle. Um, when, when, when I talk about options, that's really, uh, that that's really what I'm referring to. And again, I think about in the context of your committee, working through those conversations to say that, you know, there are some things that, you know, at a local level structurally make a ton of sense. And there are some things that maybe we have some similarities where we can begin to talk at a more collaborative, broader geographic level. Um, so maybe the, you know, maybe the right option is somewhere in the middle. So I, I always want to talk about options rather than, you know, your committee didn't start by saying, you know, what we're doing today isn't working right. and we want to get to this end point, right? We're actually navigating that conversation through a range of possibilities. And when I talk about options, it's, it's, it means just that. Okay, so in other words, a set of recommendations that would actually be a range of possibilities. Correct, correct. Which, you know, may be appropriate in some cases <coughs> and not appropriate in others. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Which is why, you know, again, different committees will um, will have a different number of options. There may be committees that decide, you know what, what we're doing today in, you know, issue or service area X makes sense. We don't see uh, immediate opportunity or long range opportunity to improve. So we're not going to recommend change for the sake of recommending change, right? Every committee has that has that prerogative if it, uh, you know, if, if that's where it uh, ends up. Sure. My colleague Pat Smith had his uh, uh, a, a new member of the CGR team. We're uh, uh, really happy to have him on board. He's not been he's not working on this project per se, uh, but we've been uh, trying to get Pat out and about with the team to uh, have an opportunity to see the kind of work that we do and uh, great client groups like him. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now we're going to go through the committee reports and. Um, I'll ask you to uh, introduce your committee uh, members briefly and then talk about what you've been working on. If I could just say, uh, beg your indulgence for a second, I um, have enjoyed working with all of your committees over the phone. It's much, much, much better to be here. I'm delighted to be here with you today. <coughs> um, and I have to also say, when I hear a young person in their 20s studying Maxwell, say one of the, th the things that they're most worried about is getting more people involved and active in local government. I, that really inspires me. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so let's begin with uh, the Public Engagement Committee, and that's uh, Melanie Littlejohn. I don't think I'm doing very well. Sure. No, no, excuse me. I just got a text from Steve. Can we move up to where Joe is? It's hard for the people on the phone to hear from them. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to move over. <laughs> can you hear me at this level, Steve? I can hear you. Thanks very much. Okay, we're moving, Melanie. We'll have the committee reports made from right here next to the phone. Sure, sure. No, I've gotten into this one. That should be fun. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. I'm going to do the work like it used to. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, the, the public engagement team. Um, continues to look at multiple strategies in which we uh, engage the public, of which over the last, oh goodness, the last few months, um, and, then, and then we just actually took a macro look at um, our touch points. And so here's some good numbers. 
in the last um, four months, we, five months, we have reached over over a thousand uh, folks individually. Um, we've had touch points with um, about 30 organizations, and um, we've hit all of uh, the media outlets. We've created some inroads into um, non-traditional media outlets as well. Um, touching, um, we've had, more our, of course, our public for forums, um, and we've hit the airways in a big way. Um, and with our last, certainly being Joe, and uh, Sharon's a, a, a big thank you to them as well. A couple of other opportunities that we are looking at um, will be uh, home shows or any other type of venue that we might be able to um, tag along with uh, a current partner. Home Builders Association, for example, we will be with them at um, the Home and Garden Show. Looking for other um, grassroots opportunities to connect. Uh, so we're looking at the um, uh, regional market as a potential opportunity. I think next week, no, please, we are heading over to La Liga uh, to look at various ways that we engage the public. <coughs> this morning, Mark and I met with WCMY um, in terms of a longer, bigger strategy in terms of engagement. And, and I think that's really one of the key focuses of the engage, public engagement um, committee, is to look at all of the demographics that we are trying to connect and attach to, and figure out what's the appropriate strategy. Um, and that's why our Maxwell students will be critical to help us really advance and elevate this um, portion of the discussion. WCNY, certainly, you know, we, Murph and I walked away very enthused about um, the possibilities. And so over the next hopefully few weeks, we will um, round out a strategy in that regard and bring it back to uh, this committee for review. The, what we need most from the people around the table is access to networks. Um, if there are organizations that we need to connect with and to um, that go beyond those that we've already attached, please let us know. Um, we will get out and we will do our <coughs> public meetings. Last week we met with the 40 Below uh, team, and uh, again, there is some enthusiasm, but we gotta, once we get into the door, we begin to, to, to shape and talk about the story. So any way that you can all help us in that regard would be deeply appreciative, and then hopefully <coughs> sometime the, in our June meeting we'll have a little bit more update on our Maxwell Capstone project. Questions? Or team, did I forget anything? I feel like I... Or, 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 be more anything. Just if I could, <coughs> could offer, um, <coughs> at the beginning of this process, I, I um, one of my comments that I, that I felt strongly about was the, um, the um, online, social network sort of portion of this and how to get as many stakeholders involved in this process as we could, albeit remotely through internet and you know another another um, <coughs> access point. So I think a lot of the people around the table um, pay attention to the packing we <coughs> serve. Yeah. Which you know I think we can utilize those folks mm -hmm. and I think um, Mike Stanton has even offered to help, uh, but, and I think that's great. But my thought was to create something of our own that people who visit our website could find out how to begin this discussion. And of course, it's all very general right now. But when we do have, when we do start to have options and ideas that are out there that people can actually comment on, weigh in on, um, I'm wondering how we. Can, can get to th literally thousands of people and they can come in as needed. And the thought was, you know, those, those can turn kind of sour. Uh, somebody can lead the discussion, make it more negative than it is, have someone to manage that aspect of it too. Is there thought given to, maybe I'm way off base here, but is there thought given to that? Sure, I mean, that's really a part of the whole social media strategy, right? 
and it really about that engagement and that's directly what those four young people at that other end of the table and I believe there's even something that we were already beginning to chat about um, what is it called the data dialogue app, yeah, dialogue dialogue app. app. Um, would you like to, to, to talk about that idea because it's, yeah. it's a good one. yeah sure it's a pretty cool platform online so people can submit ideas so you pretty much pose a challenge or a problem and then people can submit their ideas they can rank them they tag them so you can quickly see like what are the biggest themes that people are talking about um, you can comment them and then or comment on them and then when you download them you can say like what are the ideas that have the most comments what are the ideas that are the highest rated so it's really great for organizing data as well and so like the looking back at ID1 or like the um, environmental evaluation survey for the audit for the um, amphitheater right on the lake, you know, the, the secret pro process, this could really, really help um, reduce the administrative burden of having all these comments printed and evaluated by hand in big binders. <coughs> and this cuts through that. Um, and one of the, I mean, one of the functions is that, yes, comments are very easily tagged and sorted and you can filter them, <coughs> kind of like working an Excel spreadsheet very well. So that's like one of the great sort of you know, admin functions that this really helps cut down on. And so a big part of that could be tagged to our website um, that we could roll out with our overall media strategy. We look for touch points in how we can drive <coughs> stories. Um, you, know, I know, you know, Kevin um, as well has, has worked on that piece as well. How do we drive stories and, and engagement? Um, and from the social media space, uh, I think at our meeting last week when I was with at Point Below, they were tweeting left and right, and um, you know, so we got some good, good momentum. So it, I guess the moral of the story for us is we have to really engage at every level, um, and you know, so the, the next big piece is strategically, what are the key. Um, ways in which we engage certain demographics. Um, and so that's that will be a big part of the strategy that will be tied to the capstone project um, with the students, is really to hone in on demographically how, what's the best way to reach um, and, and really continue that. And I think we'll have through the summer to really refine those strategies because we believe come fall, we <coughs> get to the options or recommend recommendations phase. We, we need to have a well-oiled machine in terms of a strategic approach to engagement. So this is almost like our trial and error phase to figure out what's the best ways in which to make it work. So, all right. Great team. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next next report is Amy Yachty, and it's the Municipal Operations Committee, who I know also is very active in that Monday morning for about seven hours. <laughs> Actually, we've had two meetings since our last general meeting. We met on April 27th and we met on May 26th. And our committee has acted early on, as I mentioned earlier. Instead of adding to our numbers, is to every meeting bring in some experts to address certain issues that we are looking at, some of the services and the municipalities. And I must say, it's been a wonderful learning experience for us. It gave us an in-depth information and we begin every meeting by asking people who come to speak to us if they are familiar with the work of Penn Census. And uh, I would say the majority are, although I think last time that was not the case. So we gave a brief overview of the work of the committee. And we also begin by saying our intent is not to assume that things are broken and we need to fix them. That there may be a lot of things that are going very well but the only constant in life is change, and we need to look at the way we do things in light of advancing <coughs> technology, changes in population. And, um, and so we always ask people also if they were to begin with a clean slate, what would they do? How would they perform their functions? So 
at the April meeting, we actually had, uh, we got the word property assessment and tax assessors, are the people who came to speak to us. And we had John Weber, who represented the county, and Robert Vick, who represented the town of Clay. And at the moment, there are several municipalities that actually seem to be working well on sharing the assessment function. And there is an effort underway to begin collecting information uh, on the same software system. I can't help but think, listening to your comment right now about how things are written on paper, and we are constantly surprised how much of the information um, is still the old-fashioned way, is still written on paper and in different files, and people are reluctant to um, take that additional step uh, to move and utilize it. Uh, technology, but many are happy to move in this direction. So uh, I think uh, they offer that IT and computer software can definitely streamline and consolidate the assessment work in the whole county. But as with other services, there is a fear that if we develop a countywide assessment, work, the assessor will become too far removed from the uniqueness of the locality. And I have to share with you that this is a common thread in almost everyone who spoke to us. The concern is if everything became countywide, uh, that the different municipalities may lose their local flavor. And so I think that's something we need to be very mindful of, that that is an important aspect to the people of each municipality. But it definitely is a recurring theme. The other recurring theme, actually, was that they are all happy to look at things and figure out a way of doing things more efficiently. Uh, but there are things beyond their control. And I have a feeling that when it gets to writing our report at the end, there will be a mention of the things that are beyond their control that are at the state level. And so we need to be mindful of that as well, because that appeared to almost every person who came to speak to us. So, but they, they also talked about exemptions, such as the START program, which is a state program, uh, created a large workload on the offices since they must verify the applicant qualifies for the exemption, and this seems to take a lot of time and effort, and many felt they are not really fully staffed to do that. This week, um, we uh, actually had a very interesting meeting, and we even started here today, all of us talking about the meeting. And Jim, I was very happy that you were there in person. It was good to have you. We were happy to have also Yolanda and Jordan join us. And uh, I hope you found the meeting informative, both of you. And yes. you may comment at the, at the very end. Um, we do have a lot of fun in our committee. I have to tell you, we worked hard, so we began by celebrating Mark's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but birthday week. It was, it was birthday week for us. But we actually, this time, we um, focused on the code enforcement. And that includes housing inspectors, plan reviewers, and vacant property oversight. Uh, I wish you could have all heard that discussion, uh, because I had actually no idea how much time they all spend on managing vacant properties or worrying about who is going to manage it. Uh, somebody said, do you snow plow? And they said, no, we do not plow, actually, but we just cut the grass and make sure that somebody worries about the rest. But we had Ken Towsley uh, from the city of Syracuse and Peter Albrigo, who was the code enforcement officer for the town of Gallus and the village of Salve. So there's already some <coughs> operation in, uh, in there. They, both officers said they spent a lot of time dealing with absentee landlords and vacant properties. There are 1,800 vacant properties in the city and 70 in Solvay. And um, since resources and staff are limited, they have both attempted to strategically use their funds to benefit the neighborhood. So uh, they just want to make sure that while uh, people cannot fix the inside of a vacant property, but at least they look at the outside and the structure. So it is not a menace to the neighborhood. <coughs> the neighbors often complain when a property is, is abandoned. Um, so they have a persistent problem with certain properties, and it takes a long time for remedy to come from the court system. We did ask them how long does it take for a vacant property to move on to another phase, to be claimed by either whoever it is. And sometimes it takes as long as seven years, which is a very, very long time. And so when asked if they could start with a uh, clean slate, what would they do? And both of them mentioned 
we can process for, um, for a housing court so it doesn't take as long as seven years. Better software and information sharing, that was a common thread also. They all felt it would be so much easier if there's some information on all the, uh, all the landlords or all the tenants who tend to be problem tenants, that it would help people with the solution. Countywide plan reviewer with everyone using the same codes. There are different codes that are being used right now. <coughs> and finally, county housing court for landlord tenant disputes. And they all made the point that in talking about vacant properties uh, and in talking about <coughs> some rundown properties, that it's not always the landlord, that there are some tenants also that are very difficult tenants and having some general information that can be shared with people. So there are opportunities, they all felt and we did, uh, through IT, computer software, GIS, to coordinate information about properties, which would cut down on a lot of time and, and, and both properties and owners and full GIS system for every property would be an enormous benefit to all. Now, so far in our committee, we have heard from clerks, from the court system, from property and tax assessors, and code enforcement. And based on the initial uh, charge to this committee, we still feel we need to hear from social services and we need to hear from libraries. And we hope to do that on July 20th, which is when our planned meeting. Um, and Moni, who serves on our committee, would be talking to us about social services and we're working on getting the speaker who will be speaking to us about the libraries and how that system works. And based on that, uh, we feel that we are in a position to start a first draft uh, towards the white paper that Joe has been talking about. And that would obviously not be a final, but that would be tweaked a lot based on the input that we will get from a lot of people who've been part of this. So I invite the committee to add anything to that, and uh, also Yolanda and Jordan, if you have any comments on the last meeting that you attended. I had taken uh, metropolitan government politics and the discussion around zombie homes in the land bank was all very familiar, and it was interesting to hear it from a different perspective as well. Um, so that was my takeaway from the meeting, but um, yeah. Yeah, just to kind of reiterate what you said at the beginning of the meeting, just how much of this information isn't coordinated and how much is still in paper record, which can be hard to retrieve. Um, I think one of the speakers at the meeting said that they didn't start using the computer until about 2012, so that just kind of paints a picture of what kind of work we have to do um, going forward to get to the point where we start coordinating our information, being able to utilize technology. And I think that amongst ourselves this morning, we were just talking, we were starting to think of how we can take all that information and imagine putting it all on one system. And um, and that it's not going to be more expensive. As a matter of fact, it is going to be much more efficient and cost effective. So um, I think that's a concern for a lot of people because they think we can become a change the way we put the information. Infrastructure is an accident. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> the infrastructure committee has actually held five meetings since we last had a full commission meeting. So we've been very busy. Um, we believe that we're making significant progress towards the recommendation phase of our work. Um, one big decision we made at our April 7th meeting was that um, we were going to break the infrastructure into seven major areas and, and, do, and actually do, you know, a recommendation or set of options based for each of those seven areas. Um, and those are um, DPW highways and roads, that would be number one, water, wastewater, trash, parks, broadband, and, and we've also decided to include mass transit. So we we uh, we have a lot to we have a lot to do. We have we have a long way to go before we get to, before we get to uh, um, <clears throat> our final recommendations. We, we have a lot of work to do. Um, I would just like to thank Joe uh, and, and CGR for what they've 
presented for us already. We, we have a, a you know, preliminary document on, on street and highway maintenance, um, which if, if you had to pick out a category, I think within, within infrastructure and just looking at on Dog County, where we have 36 um, separate governmental entities, essentially, you know, all with public, uh, you know, all with highway departments. And if you had to start over again, since we would do, you know, so we think there's, it would appear that there's a lot of potential there. <coughs> the, other, the other interesting thing about highways DPW is that um, we think that there's some models out there for um, uh, for us to look at that things that are being done elsewhere in the state, um, primarily uh, the Shimon County model, which really um, focuses not so much on geography but on density, and, uh, and that's a, a focus of I think a lot of the infrastructure work that we're going to be doing down the road is is looking at um, the county. You know, really, from how do we pro how do we best provide the services? That's really isn't that really the issue? We have? So um, we think we're making some progress. We're getting excellent support from CGR, um, and we have a lot of work to go. We still have work to do. Um, for example, <coughs> on that on that screen highway maintenance issue, um, we th the the concept that we would propose, we think, okay, at least in the preliminary form, would be a Unified core highway services area, which which really is based on density. Um, <clears throat> I would just like to, to. I think that uh, one of the interesting things that's happened with, uh, with our with the infrastructure committee has been the work that we've done with the uh, Circus 2020 um, Community Task Quality Community Task Force. Do I have that right? There? Um, uh, the people that have come. To, to the table from that committee, including Ron Berger, Leo Shosholi, and, and there's some other members of the committee. David Wright. David Wright is here. And, uh, so we think we have a good crew. Um, I, I, I'm a little concerned about how we're going to, you know, how we're going to do the iterations of, of the paperwork. So <laughs> I think it's, there's going to be some work there. Um, and, and again, I think just you know, capacity. Who's going to get all this? This writing. Not just her. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and then uh, you know, public engagement obviously is, is a major issue for us. Uh, we did. We also got a call from the Home Builders Association to do a uh, meeting with them to let their members come in and present to us on what, what they would like to see happen. And then I think just the last thing I would like to say is that um, <clears throat> what we're really seeing is, um, since we've gotten started here, is there's an increasing sense of urgency around infrastructure issues. Um, not only here, not in Dark County, but at the statewide and, and the federal level. So, you know, and here we are with this decision that we're making on 81, which I'm starting to think is really critical for what's going to happen to this.
Um, but anyway, let me, let me recap fire and EMS. We've been meeting since December. We've had a number of meetings. We've interviewed experts, chiefs of fire from volunteer fire departments, the Syracuse fire chief, uh, ambulance providers. Um, we have interviewed the uh, people up at 9-11, the 9-11 center, where we've held a few of our meetings. Uh, interviewed them on opportunities that they see for improvement and things that they do. In fact, um, there's one guy up at 911 who provided us with all of this information, maps that show um, where firehouses are, where ambulance stations are, uh, giving us numbers of calls and types of calls, locations of calls, times of day of calls. Um, very interesting information that points out that there are some overlaps and gaps in coverage of, for these service providers. Um, we've completed our interviews with all of the experts. Uh, we've gathered a tremendous amount of information. We've looked at best practices from uh, Monroe County to Virginia and the Carolinas. Um, we've looked at a number of trends that are affecting service. Let me just give you a couple of trends because I think they're interesting. Uh, there's a declining pool of volunteers throughout Mondoggy County. Volunteer fire departments there are 56 of them, have a really hard time recruiting volunteers. And that is affecting the quality of service that they are providing. And that's a trend that is really increasing. Um, there's a, a decreasing availability of volunteers during daytime hours. Uh, volume of EMS calls throughout the county, county are increasing due to an aging population changing demographics, increased drug use, uh, and other factors. So we've got EMS calls going up in the county. <clears throat> and then there are a number of other demands that are uh, uh, on these volunteer fire departments for increased job training, uh, more stringent government standards and regulations, and, um, <clears throat> and we have a whole list of these trends. We have identified a number of areas for uh, improvement throughout the county. Um, improvement in the way it's structured, the way it's staffed, uh, the way they do purchasing, planning, uh, delivering their services. We've identified the gaps and the overlaps of coverage, and we have put together, we've already developed a range of options for EMS, ambulance services, and for fire. So we have a few options for each. We are at the point now where we can evaluate each one of those options and make recommendations. I think that our recommendations will come in the form of things that we should do immediately uh, for fire and EMS service. Uh, one of the things that we will definitely recommend is a centralized planning and administrative function to do a whole wide range of things uh, to plan for where uh, firehouses should be located, whether or not they should be built, um, uh, planning for staffing. This organization would also develop a pool of career firefighters, paid firefighters that can um, be assigned to supplement the volunteer forces because, again, we have uh, fire districts that don't have enough volunteers. So we're going to begin to, we're going to recommend that they begin to uh, fill those vacant positions on an as-needed basis with career firefighters and EMS people. Um, so we'll have this immediate implement, implementation things that they can do immediately, and then a transition plan. Um, if the trend of declining volunteers is going to continue into the future, then we need some transition from that volunteer fire uh, force to perhaps career people. Um, so we, uh, I guess in the next month, we'll be wrapping up that part of it and at the same time wrapping up the police study. So any questions, comments? It's very interesting, very lively and candid discussions, <laughs> very candid discussions with all of these experts. Um, 
but I think that, you know, uh, I was concerned at the beginning that the volunteer fire people would not be forthcoming with, you know, problems that they're having and so forth. And they really have been very open about that. They've been great in terms of saying, well, here's, here are the things that we should improve. And uh, so I think we have, uh, we have pretty good consensus among the people that have come to our committee and discussed this with us. I have to say <coughs> that the information, some of the information is really pretty astonishing. I'm a resident of the town of Mount Valley. There are eight fire districts in the town of Mount Valley. Uh, and in the, in the rural areas, Cisco, um, Spafford, and so on, if they have one fire in two or three years, it's about average. So you can see how difficult it can train people uh, and get them used to actually fighting fire fires. Having said that, I was out of the lake yesterday and we started hearing sirens. More, 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 and more sirens. And I think it was one of Gordon Ireland's barns burned up the corner of uh, Ivory Road and Rose Hill Road. Um, but there were at least those eight town of Onondaga fire departments, <laughs> plus, plus Baffert, plus Kitty Atlas, plus Amber, plus Francisco. Uh, they just shut that whole side of the lake down. So, if they, if they each count that as one of their fires in two or three years, you can see um, we have some redundancy in the system. Obviously, you want them there as quickly as possible. Um, and they were there. Well, your point is well taken. If you look at the fires that occurred in the last few months in the suburbs, you would note that um, 10 to 12 fire departments responded to each one of those. And in some cases, the property was um, 911 says that very often they have to dispatch a number of different departments because they don't have enough people in any <coughs> one given department to take care of the problem. So now they're dispatching all of these departments <coughs> to that fire. It's the only thing left was to the factory <laughs> There's a lot of opportunity for fire. Uh, uh, all right, economic uh, development gets very respect. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the task of the Economic Development Committee is really to look at whether the structures of local government have an impact on whether this region grows or whether, or how the how region grows. Um, recently, uh, our, our most recent meeting our committee has taken a virtual uh, tour of uh, the, the Twin Cities area, and um, our committee members include Rob Simpson from Center State, um, Andrew Maxwell from, I think he's now the head of the Office of Innovation for the Mayor, formerly from uh, the Regional Planning uh, from SACPA, uh, Dr. Dennis Nave, Eric Persons from Government Relations at Syracuse University, and um, our committee and our uh, consensus chair, Super Paul. Um, our last meeting focused on uh, the, the issue of tax sharing, uh, possibilities um, that are, are uh, presented by tax sharing arrangements, and we dedicated the last meeting to looking at the uh, tax sharing arrangements in the Twin City area. Um, that uh, program is called the Twin Cities Fiscal Disparities Program, and it's aimed at four or five different um, objectives. One is to reduce incentives for ineffective competition within a region uh, for tax base. It's something that can happen when you have a balkanized uh, taxing system, such as we have in New York State. It's also um, aimed at encouraging joint um, economic <coughs> development efforts and enhancing long-run long regional growth. Um, the program complements regional land use planning efforts by spreading uh, the tax benefits of regional planning decisions across the whole region and also reduces inequalities in tax rates and services by giving larger shares of the pool to lower tax uh, base uh, places. This is a, a program that has been in place, I don't recall how many years. 70s? Uh, it's you know, been several it's decades. 71. 71. And over that period, the um, program 
has placed 40% of the growth in the commercial industrial tax base for each municipality uh, in each year into a seven county regional pool, then distributes that tax base uh, back across the region to participating municipalities and school districts uh, based on tax base and based on population. And then that redistributed tax base is, is, is taxed in each location at its at its own tax rate. So we had a, um, a long discussion first trying to understand it and then talking about the potential application of some sort of tax sharing uh, to, to, our, um, to our region. And that was our last meeting. Our next region also stays in the Twin Cities area. We're having a joint uh, meeting with the governance uh, uh, committee um, to meet and I think we're having a presentation by um, Myron Orfield, who is the architect of the Municipal Council for the Twin Cities area, and that meeting will be uh, held on June 23rd. Uh, that is probably the meeting you were speaking about, where we would encourage everyone to uh, um, visit virtually if you, if you care to. So that's what we've been doing in um, the Economic Development Committee, and I look forward to working with the Governance Committee. Any questions? Anyone on the committee want to add anything to that? Rob? No, it's a great overview. Okay. Thank you. It's Thanks. a great region to try to emulate. They're doing, they're doing a great job there. The um, last uh, report <coughs> comes from the Governance Committee and Donna DiCiato and Steve Meyer, co chair. And Donna is not here. I think Steve still is on the phone. Steve, are you there, Steve? I am. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much. Sorry I can't be there today. Uh, in any event, uh, as, as you all know, uh, governance is in the process of reviewing a range of structural governance options, which could be considered as a part of the consensus effort. Our work up to this point has been getting contacts with and hearing from communities around the country, which provide living examples of some of these options. Uh, one example uh, was someone we heard from at the April 11th meeting, uh, a gentleman by the name of J uh, Jason Dudich. He's the chief of staff to the mayor of uh, Indianapolis, uh, and that uh, operation has undergone quite a lot of change um, over the last several years. And I, I'm gonna just read an excerpt from, uh, uh, from our committee meeting minutes that, that puts this in perspective. So it's just taking a minute here, but uh, in 1970, a new governing structure known colloquially as UNIGOV merged the governments of the city of Indianapolis and Marion County. A product of unique political movement, political actors, and a fractured opposition, UNIGOV has been viewed both as a model for city-county consolidation in the late 20th century and as tepid reform motivated by political calculation rather than public interest. Unigov has been assessed as an agent for growth, helping the region emerge through global economic restructuring and revitalizing the dying urban core in the wake of suburbanization. Despite failing to simplify government, reorganization has been seen as instrumental in revitalizing the city's core. They've been credited with attracting to Indianapolis through uh, various public-private partnerships, a large number of business investment, which has spurred economic growth and job opportunities. So this is just one example, but it, it, it provides some evidence that there's more than one way to skin a cat. And uh, we're going to continue our process to hear from others. Um, and I, I should add uh, also that the committee uh, developed a matrix of attributes which we believe were uh, key for a good governance model. And these fall into four categories, uh, cost, service, governance, and emotional aspects. And what we're doing is we, we listen to uh, a number of these uh, officials from other communities. We're just uh, referring to this matrix as we listen to and evaluate these examples. Uh, June 11th, uh, we're gonna meet with a representative from Louisville and learn about their form of governance and, and what's changed through the years. Um, uh, June 23, we're going to have a joint committee meeting of governance and economic development. Uh, 
um, when we're going to be meeting with uh, Dr. Meyer of Orfield, who's the driver behind the Minneapolis, Minneapolis St. Paul uh, metropolitan form of government. Uh, and then the last point I'll make, uh, since we're, we're really getting deep into the process now, is, is that um, we're going to open our meetings uh, for really anyone on uh, the Consensus Commission to attend, uh, just as a means to um, share the information and, and, and spread it as broadly as we can. Since we're, I think in some ways, we're, our committee's efforts are, are probably bringing up the rear, uh, so to speak, in terms of uh, a consensus effort. And that's my report. Any questions for Steve? We have no questions. Good report. Thanks. All right, that completes the committee reports. Uh, does anybody else have anything they'd like to add? Can we go to the order? Jim, I would add to what Steve just said, is that uh, any member of this commission is welcome to attend the municipalities. And I think the more we have, uh, the better job we have at the end, right? So <coughs> I will do that so is everyone getting the committee notices regardless of whether they're on subcommittees yeah. or not or the committees or not? I don't think you are getting some. It, it might be correct, but we will do that from here yeah. on. Everybody we'll try to do that. Yeah. It's more emails, but at <coughs> least it's more cross-pollination that way. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Yes, Pete. I just, some of us were having a conversation the other day, and this goes counter to my positive outlook on life, but we want to show people stories that have worked, but let's tell them the stories that haven't worked, right? As a way of saying we could be this, or if we keep going the way we're going, we could be this. And I don't know that we've talked about <coughs> doing that kind of comparative analysis. Right. It could be single. Well, I, I think that's a very good point. Not only what we project ourselves as possible being, <coughs> but what have we seen across the nation? But, I, I, that's, right. a, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, that's I, I, my thought. We, we, we've talked about this a couple of times in the public engagement committee, and you know we have a list, mm -hmm. right? And we have a list of those who did it well, mm -hmm. and those that missed the mark a little. Uh, you learned about someone else this morning um, in Buffalo. Um, actually, Tana Amherst, right? I think he was more around. John? Kevin? Kevin Gone. Oh, yeah. Gone. Gone. Kevin Gone. 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 Yes, He's Kevin Gone. Trying to reduce the number of elected officials. Yeah. That's what this campaign is. Okay. Oh. And, and so, so, oh, there's, there's some value in looking at both sides of the coin. Um, and you know what, we'll, if, if the commission would like, we'll take that back on and, and really figure out how we can illustrate that. That's the good point. Got to look at both sides, you know. And people need to know we looked at both sides, yeah. right? That we're not Pollyanna. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you learn as much from a, from a story that can be involved yeah. as you yeah. learn from a story that has been. I mean, in the not too distant past, Buffalo went through a very similar process. I mean, that was 12, 13 years ago. And my friend Bill Griner was the head. It was the Griner yes. Commission. Right. And um, it was a um, tremendous failure. <coughs> and, and it was a tremendous amount of effort that went into it, too. And it may not be a bad thing to revisit the reasons that that effort mm -hmm. failed. What, what do you mean it failed? It was not implemented? or? None of, the, none of the recommendations were implemented. None were implemented, and we know what happened in Buffalo in Erie County. We got a billion dollars last year. They lost another generation of students. Hey, Larry, right? we've been a half a they billion. Lost. <laughs> right, Rob? <laughs> what about it? Oh, Rob, I thought it was a billion. We're done. It's going to be great. Oh, <laughs> Rob, I thought we were doubled up. Anyone else? You and I are going to talk after. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's really an interesting, we all know it's interesting, but um, 
there are lots of, are lots of outcomes, as we've seen, for different communities. Uh, what I was struck by was that in, in Indianapolis, there was no vote anywhere on this, um, that amongst the people. Yeah. Uh, you had a Republican mayor, which was unusual for Indianapolis, a Republican city council, which was almost unheard of. You had a Republican le legislature, both houses, and a Republican governor. Um, that was slam dunked. They just did it. Now, um, New York is far more complicated than that, although we are getting to be, to be a one-party state here also, uh, at least in this uh, part of it. Um, politics is going to be important in this. Uh, we have some elected officials who are, um, you know, participating today. Some of them will be up for election during this process. So um, I think we all need to keep that in mind that you know, politics is, is volatile at times. Um, it, uh, sometimes it's very enlightening for people. This will at some point become part of the dialogue in campaigns, whether it's this year or next. <coughs> And uh, I think we all need to really, as these actions come out, we really need to understand them, be able to explain them to people at the grocery store, at the gas station, at church, um, and be ready to do that outreach that Melanie uh, and her committee are planning um, on a very personal basis. Uh, it's because people, once they know what we're doing, and most people really don't yet, People in government, I think, most people don't. They're going to ask us questions. I, I'm, you know, I did it for 31 years, going to Wegmans or going to church or going to the gas station and being confronted with an issue. And you really have to be ready for it. And so we all need to, this idea of cross pollinating the committees, I think, is a really good idea because we're going to get questions that we don't know about. The, our committee hasn't worked on, but we're going to be expected to have an answer. And how we answer that is going to influence two or three or four or five or 10 or 20 people. So um, the committees have really worked hard. We need to do a really good job of sharing that information and uh, familiarizing ourselves with the proper responses to those questions. But I, I, I talked to, to, I talked to the dean the other night, my wife, uh, who always has the county man view. So I said, well, did you know that the town of Marcellus, the village of Marcellus, is its own public works department, one mile of road. She said, no, I didn't know that. She said, well, I said, think about that. We've got a superintendent, employees, mechanic, equipment, all for one mile of road. She said, okay, well, who paid for that? And I said, the people in the village, the people that get the benefit of that. She said, do they think they get good service? And I said, yeah, they probably do. Uh, it's I would think it'd be pretty good service to have your own snowplow for a mile ago. Um, she said, "Well, if they don't mind paying for it uh, and they get good service, you better have a good reason why they want to change." I said, "You know what? You're right." <laughs> and those are the kind of things we're going to hear. Jim was even another story about that. Immediately abutting the village limits for ourselves <laughs> is a county town bond with all of their road maintenance equipment. <coughs> but it's roughly 10 times the size of the bottom of the village of Marcellus. Rover's getting close to Rover. <laughs> 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 Anything else, Neil? I, I just want to thank everybody. You know, you can just sense all of this is just picking up a lot of energy. You can see that we've gone through the preliminaries and people really now dig in with that. I can't thank uh, CGR, Joe, and his colleagues any, any, any more. But, you know, you, you're really helping us tremendously, <coughs> helping, helping us carry this through the process. And I think we're starting to see the results of your efforts in, in terms of uh, providing the structure and the general guidance. Thank you. I think we're going to have something new that comes out of this. So. Any uh, additional comments? If none, uh, we'll clear the meeting closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.